Well, good morning. Uh, Kaiju Masterclass is in session, Kaiju Masterclass 2. Uh, we're very pleased to kick off uh, this morning with uh, Linda Haynes, actress Linda Haynes. We're really pleased and privileged to have her with us uh, live this morning. Uh, Linda, of course, is best known to fans of this genre as one of the stars of Latitude Zero, directed by Shiro Honda for Toho Studios. But that's really just one aspect of an acting career that took her from Hollywood to Tokyo and back to Hollywood. Uh, she appeared in a number of really interesting uh, productions in Hollywood in the early 1970s. We're going to talk about that as well. Uh, just uh, some orders of business here. Kaiju Masterclass has a full slate of programming all day today and tomorrow uh, to keep track of all the live streams and all the programs we offer. Uh, please uh, keep looking at kaijumasterclass.com at both the schedule page and on the home page, you'll see a watch button that will take you directly to our YouTube channel where all the programming is located. And with that, I'm Steve Reifel. I'm here with Ed Gajacheski. We'll be answering the, uh, asking the questions. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, a real treat. So we are very uh, thankful to you to spending this time with us. Um, Ed, why don't you kick it off with the, our first question? Okay, well, uh, most basic question of all, you know, how did you get into acting as a career? Oh, um, I had no, I had no um, aspiration to be an actor because um, really my nature was one of um, trying to not be noticed. But I had... Um, quit school, got married when I was 16 in Vegas, and um, we moved uh, to Los Angeles, and um, uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do with myself, but we were walking our dog on Beverly Drive, I think, and um, a big white Cadillac uh, pulled up beside us, and uh, the and the guy in the in in the Cadillac um, said he wanted uh, to give us his card so that we could visit his acting class, and um, so we took it. And I don't know how it was that I came to to go there, but um, anyway, I went, and it was Ben Bard from the silent film from that era. And um, I, uh, I kind of, I just didn't have anything else to do. So I continued and um, I stayed with him. I don't know how, how long I would say, um, probably six months. And um, then he had a showcase and um, we did a showcase where each person did a scene with somebody else and he invited people there to, to watch. And, um, I, that's how I got my first agent. Um, I signed with, um, a man by the name of an agent by the name of M Maury Calder. And, um, then he sent me, and I was nervous because it was not really anything I wanted to do, but for lack of any other direction, um, I went and I, I did get a part in, in like Flint, um, where I played a, a girl who, who was uh, dressed like a boy and we kidnapped the president on the golf course. And that was my first part. And they also... And that was during the time when um, a whole nother era, really, uh, Fox was still had um, their contract players. And um, I got a screen test for that. And they didn't like it. I can't remember who the head of um, Fox was then, but he looked at it and he didn't like the test, the screen test. So that was out. Um, then my next thing was, I don't know if it was a room 222. 
I think it was latitude zero. Um, so that's how it started. It was like, um, I certainly didn't, I mean, I, I responded, but I never, I didn't pursue it to begin with. Um, you know, I kind of just, uh, went wherever the wind blew me. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you happen to remember the story of how you got cast? Uh, your role in, in Latitude Zero is, uh, Dr. Ann Barton and, um, do you remember how that came about? And I must have gone on an interview, and I think that Warren Lewis and and probably Don Sharp were there. Um, that, uh, because I don't remember meeting any of the Japanese crew. Um, Honda San was not there. It was mm -hmm. just the Americans, so. Um, Did you realize that was a Japanese production when you interviewed for it? Mm. I probably had some idea, but I'm not really sure if I did or not. It's terrible when you can't remember, but it's been 50 <laughs> years, so. 50 yeah. years. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now the uh, Don Sharp and his uh, partners had uh, the rights to this story, Latitude Zero. They'd actually been trying to make it into a film and uh, also a television show for a number of years by that point, dating to the 1950s. Uh, but it, it was based on a radio serial that had aired in the 1940s. So it, the property had been kicking around for some time wow. and they finally made a deal to produce it. A number of people were going and partnering with Toho and making uh, science fiction films uh, between the U.S. and Japan in the 60s. And so they, they followed that path. So that's how it came about. Uh-huh. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Did you... Uh, did you, so did you have any idea that Joseph Cotton and Cesar Romero and, and these other actors were going to be in the production that you were? I did. And um, I told my father that Joseph Cotton was one of the stars. And he got very, very impressed. I, I knew his name and Cesar Romero, too. But I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know what he looked like until I got on the plane with him. So I was well, in like another world, um, <laughs> I guess. Now tell us that if you what you remember of that story, the, the the experience of traveling to Japan. Now everybody, you know, the world is much smaller. People travel all over the place, but in those days, going to Japan would have been a big deal. And so I'd love to hear whatever you can tell us about going there for the first time and traveling on the plane with whoever else was on there with you, landing there, all that that stuff. That must have been really uh, exciting and overwhelming. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, it was a, a really beautiful flight. And um, I sat next to Dick Jekyll, and he was very sweet and nice and talked. And um, he looked very young, but I, I guess... He, he told me at one point he had a, a son that was my age. Mm -hmm. And um, that was amazing to me because uh, he looked so young. Um, but anyway, they, we got, um, they served sushi on the plane. <laughs> and I didn't like raw fish, I, but I, I did try it. And um, so it was a whole new world. I'd never had anything like that. And um, it was, you know, naturally a long flight, but um, it went well. And I wish I could remember. I probably didn't even ask any questions because I wouldn't have. I was kind of shy about that. And um, so I can't really remember, you know, what I talked about with him, what we talked about. But, um, but I do remember I sat next to him for all those hours. And um, then um, Joseph Cotton and Patricia Medina, I didn't really talk to them until we got there. And then the, he was very, very um, um, 
sweet and, um, you know, down to earth. And so was she. And she was very funny. And um, so, but anyway, that's, um, that was about all that I can remember of the flight. One of um, our, uh, one of our viewers just pointed out that you also are in uh We'll talk about the drowning pool later, but uh, Richard Jekyll's in that as well. Although I don't think you have any scenes together, as I recall. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about landing in Japan and, and the greeting and the way they put you up uh, in a hotel, I imagine? How to, and seeing the studio for the first time. What was that all about? Um, it was... Uh, I actually, I have a little picture of my room, my dressing room. And it was, um, it was, it wasn't plush by any means, but it was um, some place where you, where I could, you know, retire to um, between um, between takes or between scenes. Um, but um, the Toho Studios was they were the studio was much the same as um, as the studios were in LA. Yeah. Although I don't know how familiar I was with the studios in LA at that point. So I didn't, I just kind of accepted whatever, um, you know, however it was, cause uh, I had nothing to compare it to really. Mm -hmm. But um, everyone was really, um, really did their best to make us feel comfortable and they were helpful. It was a, it was really a super good experience. Um, yeah. I, unfortunately I was so young. It would have been better if I, if I were older, so I could have really appreciated it because I was nervous and, um, you know, kind of uncomfortable being away from home. Mm. And, and I was there for two months. That's so right. that, um, but I got around, I went shopping in uh, Takashimaya at that department store. And um, so it wasn't all just um, sitting in the hotel or working. Mm -hmm. um, It was, it was um, and then when we uh, we were served lunch at the studio, which I was afraid of because I thought it was going to be more raw fish, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was um, fried squid, and it was excellent. It was really good. Um, so that was a big relief, yeah. and I think that's the only time that we ever ate uh, lunch there at the cafeteria in uh, at Toho. I imagine you were probably in the, the big Toho commissary with all the other Japanese actors, right? Yeah, yeah. everyone went there to yeah. eat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned uh, the length of the production, two months. Um, Ed has a question, I believe, about related to that. Well, uh, not so much about the, the length, but, you know, in uh, Joseph Cotton in his book and others have also told the story that uh, the American producers defaulted on their side of the production costs after the shooting started. So, I mean, I don't know how you, how do you found out about that and uh, what the situation was like for you and the other actors once you found out about this. Could you uh, tell us about that situation? Yes. Um well, Joseph Cotton took the lead in that because it was it was murky to me as to what um, uh, what was happening. But he um, and I read his book, at, but I can't remember that anymore because uh, Joseph Cotton had written a book mm -hmm. um, where he explained what happened. <clears throat> and I did, I read at least part of it, but, um, but I can't remember the details. On top of that, we also got the flu, all of us did, 
And um, so that was tough. But th somehow they resolved the problem of uh, paying us because um, we stayed for the whole, um, you know, for the um, making of the whole film. So um, I guess somebody must have threatened to walk out. No, it's actually but really... You know, I didn't I didn't really participate in negotiating or threatening or anything. I was just kind of listening. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Anybody you're right. Anybody who's interested in this movie and the background of it should try to find Joseph Cotton's book. Uh, it's called Vanity Will Get You Somewhere. And he has a section on this, the experience of this film. And uh, basically, Don Sharp and, and the American producing side uh, never uh ponying up the money that they had uh, committed to providing because their finance financing in the united states fell through and so toho had to assume the full cost of the production but uh and that's one of the reasons i believe that the shoot was lengthened because things had to be stopped for a brief period of time and uh, figured out but yeah, and Joseph Cotton kind of took the lead on uh, representing the actors and making sure everybody got paid. And um, I guess the payments, he mentions in the book, if I, as I recall, they weren't able to pay right away, but like six months later, the checks actually did arrive. Uh, and uh, so th that's a really interesting story. And, and yeah, and he talks also about how everybody got sick. There was a, a flu pandemic in uh, Asia at that time, and um, it was kind of burning through uh, various parts of Japan and other countries. So it sounds like you were all victims of that. Yeah, we were, we were, and, uh, but we lived through it. It was, it was pretty bad, but, um, you know, we were, uh, we got through it. Um, I mean, you, you can see in, in some of the scenes of the movie, including, I think a scene that you're in with him, Joseph Cotton looks really sick in some scenes. I mean, he's just yeah. muscling yeah. through it. Yeah. Yeah, it was tough because it was very cold. Mm. And that um if I went out, uh it would it would be warm on the set with the lights and so on, but the minute I walked out the whole costume, the vinyl, uh, the that clear vinyl fogged up. And um that coupled with having that flu. Mm was really uncomfortable mm. but um but we got through it i don't remember um uh that it lasted that long <clears throat> did um how well did you get to know people like joseph cotton and uh caesar romero patricia medina uh what were your what was your interaction like once the production started well i got to know uh um joseph cotton and patricia medina well because uh, we stayed, we were in close proximity, the rooms in the hotel. Um, and then uh, Patricia Medina and I went shopping. And um, so I, I got to know her well. I didn't work with Cesar Romero, so I, you know, didn't get to know him. Um, uh, but Patricia Medina was, um, she was super funny and, um, um, she didn't hold back her opinions. Um, uh, she said at one point, I, I think I said something like, well, do you know if they're if the actors are going to be picked up or something like that, and um, or actresses? And she, at that point, she says, "Well, as far as as far as I'm concerned, I'm the only actress here." <laughs> Which, <laughs> and I didn't uh, I didn't argue with her. I just accepted it because I figured, well, I guess I must be doing a bad job. <clears throat> um, I didn't. Ha I wasn't. Didn't have a lot of pride or anything. I just figured. Well, I hope I get through this. Um, you know, I watched the movie yesterday, 
and and my grandkids did too. And I think my son had not seen it either. My son and daughter-in-law, they hadn't seen it. Really? And wow. um you know, it, it, when it first came out, I remember it came out in Santa Monica. We went and saw it. Um, my, the um, man that I was married to at that time. And um, we thought, I mean, the kids in the audience, if they had had tomatoes, I think they would have thrown <laughs> it. Um, they, it was not received well. And so I kind of, and I guess I didn't think, I was not into science fiction, so. But now when I saw the movie, I changed my mind. It was not at all bad. I mean, it, yeah, it's hokey with those monsters and so on. But um, I was surprised. And the quality, I guess they've, it's been remastered. Mm -hmm. And that had, and that certainly had something, you know, made it better. Um, because I think I had seen it on, I don't know, it was all very grainy when I saw it. And um, not very, the focus was, you know, strange. <laughs> yeah, I know that... Um uh it, it really after it was completed it took a while to release in the united states because their deal with don sharp and, and what whatever that would have uh opened up in terms of distribution had blown up and it really didn't play in in that many locations at that time it showed up on tv later though uh did did you get any kind of a premiere or did you <laughs> did you do the red carpet thing was there any no <laughs> No, and I suppose uh no, I don't I don't really remember. I mean it did open in the United States because we went and saw it, but that was like it, it certainly was not at the Pantages or Grauman's. <laughs> it was at a little, you know, some kind of theater in Santa Monica that um was not fancy at all. So I don't know who, uh, I guess, um, I think people saw it in v Vietnam. <clears throat> um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they did with it. Yeah. Really. Well, it, it did, it did get uh, some international release. I know I have uh, like publicity materials from Thailand. Uh, so I know it got released there mm -hmm. also from Pakistan of all places uh -huh. uh, and several several uh, several countries in Europe most like France uh, Belgium uh, England I know that in Italy they all got the, the film too because there is some publicity materials you know from those areas but it was really interesting to see that you know some of these Asian countries actually got uh, got a release on, on this film because most uh, you know, science fiction films uh, passed on on those kind of locations. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, w one question I like to ask is that you know you were you were on the film with you know a, a good your co-stars were uh, basically you know, Hollywood veterans, uh, so you know very well experienced in in uh, acting. Did anybody uh, take you know, act as your mentor on the film you know, to kind of try and guide you through the acting process? No, I would say that. Um, Honda San was, um, you know, he, he directed and yeah. no, nobody said anything really. Um, well, the translator, of course, we had that tra the translators, two of them, and um, they, you know, were able to tell me what he was saying. Mm -hmm. But he also, um, you could kind of tell what it was he wanted because I remember he would kind of explain very kind of quietly and his hand motions were like this mm -hmm. when he would talk. <clears throat> um, so no, everyone um, kind of, uh, they just did what they thought was required. And um, I, I think I, th I think I was under the impression that they thought I was kind of dull, that they would have liked to see more life. 
And I, of course, was uptight. Mm. And um, I thought that the role that I played, too, was um, it kind of worked for that role because I was supposed to be a doctor. So, mm. you know, I, I wouldn't um, really be like a... Um, I don't know. I, what? A blonde bombshell? Yeah, it wouldn't be that. Or a dipshit, as they could say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but, but anyway, um, no, no one really um, said anything. But, um, you know, I, I relied on um, the director to tell me what he wanted. And, and he did. He was, uh, you know, I liked him. It was great. Yeah, we're looking at a picture of you uh, working with him. Yeah, uh, that's for, a nice picture. Yeah. Can you tell us about your relationships and friendships with uh, the Japanese cast? In particular, I think this uh, photo is um, uh, relevant to that. Um, yes, they were. Um, they were very nice to me and. Um, Masumi Okada, he spoke um, English, so that was um, helpful. And um, um, oh, I don't remember that. Uh, that I don't remember wearing that. <laughs> no, I think this must be like uh, between it, takes. It, yeah, it looks yeah. like you're wearing something to keep warm. Yeah, because, I think so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like you said, you were shooting kind of in the winter months, and I don't think those those sets were heated, were they? Well, they were inside. They, at least they were heated by the lights. Okay. They probably did because <clears throat> um, November and December, um, so that there was really cold there. Yeah. Didn't snow, but it was it was really cold. Yeah. So. Um, I'm looking at the pictures here. <laughs> Which am I supposed to be looking at that screen or this one? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, because I keep on looking at the their pictures when I'm talking. Okay. That well, mean, okay. Yeah. No. If you, uh, I'm running the pictures as we speak, but uh, if you see no something, pictures of you and Ed, it's. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you see uh, something in these images that's worth commenting on, please do. I'm. I, I can see that we uh, we can see the scripts uh, in this uh, photograph. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what what that was that was happening. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, there's. You mentioned there were two interpreters. Uh, there's a, a woman standing there with a script in her arm. She might have been the script uh, supervisor, yeah. but I think that's Henry Okawa. Kind of his head is sort sort of obscured on the far right, and Henry Okawa was somebody who uh, right. regularly he regularly acted as an interpreter between the the Japanese and um, uh, American sides on these productions. And right. He, also, he was an actor too. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, that I didn't know, but I remember him well. Mm -hmm. And I also remember there were, that's a, the female interpreter, and that is her standing next, to, you know, behind me. Okay. But I can't remember her name. I'm sure in the credits, they must, um, the credits must, you know, say her name, name, but I've forgotten. I think her name is Suzuki. I don't know if that's. Pardon that. me? I think her name is Suzuki. I don't know if that ring, uh, rings a bell. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, all the interpretation was done by you know some of the, the people, but did did you find it really challenging to be working uh, between two different languages, where the basically cast is all speaking English and the the staff are all you know communicating in Japanese? Was that a challenge for you? Well, somewhat, but. Um... It was kind of, uh, you know, by w watching a lot of a lot of things. You, um, I think that I got, I understood what it was they wanted just by watching and listening. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, through Henry Son, he um, he would, you know, translate it. So between watching. Um, 
the director and um and then and then hearing um the tra- what he said translated then um you know i i got you know i was able to to get it <clears throat> what um well, I mean, you've kind of answered this a little bit already, but I'm interested to know uh, any further impressions you have of director Honda. You mentioned his quiet way of directing, which is something we hear from a lot of actors who've worked with him. But I'm also uh, curious to know things like, did you rehearse beforehand? Was there much rehearsal? And what kind of preparation uh, was done before you actually got to the set and started filming? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost your audio. No, she's just you coughing. did. I yeah. um, I had the cough. Oh. I'm I'm getting over COVID. Yeah, um. I'm... Anyway, um, we we did rehearse the scenes. I'm sure we blocked out what we were gonna do. Um, you, as you, you always, I mean, that's what happens on every, on every movie. Um, but they, you know, they, um, he told us what he wanted and, um, we did it as far as I know. It's hard for me to remember details because it, it's, kind of so long ago mm -hmm. and um but we managed and um and uh, and it had to do with what with watching him and his motions and and hearing whatever he was saying in japanese and understanding just by his expression or his his tone or where he was pointing and so on. And then, then we got the uh, translation on top of that. Okay. But um, I don't remember. I know we had to have rehearsed everything. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask a, a question about a particular scene. Mm -hmm. uh, today, you know, you could watch the scene where you're entering the, the bath of immunity and you take your towel off and go into the bath. Today, probably it's something that no one would even give a second thought to, but back then it was probably a little bit more of a daring scene. And I understand that there was some disagreement between uh, Warren Lewis and the Japanese side as to how they were going to film that scene. Do you recall anything about that? And what was your Well, impression? yes, I do, because they wanted me to go topless. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't want to because I didn't expect it. And I never, um, I never agreed to that. Um, so what they did was they got foam rubber, like, kind of like foam rubber pasties and they glued them on to my breasts hmm. and wanted me to do the scene that way, you know, so that it looked like I was nude, but I really wasn't. And, um, I can't remember if they shot the scene that way or what, but when I watched the movie, you just didn't see, one way or another right. um because i put on the robe but but that was it it was um i know i know that i didn't want to you know be nude mm -hmm. and then came the 70s and then yeah then everything changed of course you know in other movies and um but i was uh i stood my ground with it i didn't want to do that and um and i didn't so well that's a good point i i think what was going on there it was also you know a conflict between uh the japanese and and don sharp the hollywood side the the americans really wanted this uh nude scene or nude a brief bit of nudity be, and i think it was because 
the Hayes Code had just been dropped recently, and there was a lot of nudity popping up in American movies at that time. And it, yeah, like you said, it really kind of explodes uh, in the seventies. But even in like sci-fi movies like Logan's Run, I think Jenny Agutter is topless in that briefly, if I recall correctly, and things like that. It wasn't. It was becoming more and more common. And I think for the American market, they really wanted something like that. But Honda and the Japanese side were against it because there wasn't that type of nudity in Japanese commercial films at, at all at that time and um, in ma mainstream films anyway. And um, so it's an interesting compromise or the, the Japanese side definitely won out the way it's filmed and the way it's edited is definitely, it implies nudity, but there's, there's no visual. Uh, yeah. I think that, well, I think it that was good Yeah, because um, it is kind of a kid's movie. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like, um, but I, I can't remember if I ever even knew to begin with if uh, who's, I remember someone saying, oh, well, in Japan, there, nudity isn't anything, you know, that uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, surprise anyone. It's accepted. So I was so... Essentially, I didn't know that um, that they, you know, there were two sides to that coin. That the Japanese were okay with me not doing it. It seemed to me like they all wanted me to do it, mm. but I knew I didn't want to. Yeah, yeah and um, I should have stood my ground in a few other films <laughs> like that because. Um, Well, I think the movies you're referring to now that you worked on in the States a few years later were definitely not the type of thing for young kids. Like Latitude Zero ended up a few years later. I mean, it showed it at children's matinees in Japan as well. Yeah. So, yeah. During like uh, re-releases and things like that. So, yeah. Um, what uh, you kind of uh, mentioned shopping. Uh, what did you and the cast members do during off hours in Tokyo? Did you go out and party at all, or were you too uh, busy to do things like that? <clears throat> um, went out to dinner um, in the evening, and um, we, um, Patricia and Medina and I went um, shopping, and... Um, Ted Sherdeman's wife also, uh, I, I don't remember going with her. I don't think that I did, but um, um, she went shopping with Patricia Medina too. And um, that, um, yeah, we went out to dinner and had Kobe beef and so on, um, which was, it was very nice. I just lost my earphones here. <laughs> You back with us? Oh. She's on mute. She's on mute. Okay. Technical challenge. <laughs> it's unavoidable in this day and age. And I wanted to just commend Linda for she mentioned that she's getting over COVID. And um, I mean, it must be, I know she's recovering now, but she still has this lingering uh, cough and stuff. So thank you for powering through this interview. I know you must be, you know. I no, I, I don't I don't feel sick now. Okay. It's just that I still have a residual cough and I also can't taste anything or smell. Oh, anything, boy. But yeah. not that that is relevant to what we're doing. But No. Well, Godspeed okay, to you. Okay, now it's just like hopefully it'll stay in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you addressed this a little bit before, but yeah, I've seen a, a photo layout of you modeling uh, any number of those see-through uh, plastic type or vinyl costumes that they were designing for the film. Uh, I don't know if you can tell us anything about them. And certainly it had to be uncomfortable under the heat of the studio lights because they don't breathe. 
Yeah, right, right. Well, <laughs> now these are really very interesting pictures that you have. Yeah. And I'm, you know, Never these, um, um, I, love, I, I really love this photo. Uh, I mean, I, because you're working and it's just, it's a lovely photo of, yeah. all three of, you, of all three of you, but I just love that this is like a window into the process, you know? Right, right. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I blanked out on what it was that you asked I'm talking me. about the, the vinyl costumes. All oh, right, right. Um, yeah, they were uncomfortable because of uh, they got wet, you know, damp inside, uh, going in and out of the um, soundstage. So, um, but they were, I think that they were designed really well now that I, I look at them. I mean, I, I thought that they were good when I wore them, but... Um, in retrospect, you know, when I watch them in the movie now, I think um, they did they did good designs, and um, I noticed that we're all dressed. The whole crew was dressed in gold, um, which is kind of um, interesting. Gold lame. <laughs> My granddaughter liked it. <laughs> she said, Look, he's got gold on too. Do you, um, you mentioned, uh, or we talked about the, the fact that the shoot kind of lasted two months. I think you were there longer than you anticipated being there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, ended up having your birthday at Toho. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they, um, I had my 21st birthday there. Um, and that was shortly after we arrived. Um, and they had a big cake, and we were in the office. It, um, they had set up tables um, around the room, and um, they had a big cake, and uh, they, you know, sang happy birthday. And it was really, it was super nice, it, you know, very special. Um Yeah, that's um, well, and there is a picture of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was uh, I was looking around for it. I didn't find a, a good image of it to project here today. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Did you uh, learn any Japanese, and did you stay in touch with any of the Japanese cast members afterward? No, I didn't. Um, but. Um, I always think that's strange because you get to be really close with people that you work with. And then as soon as the, the job is over with, then that everybody goes their separate way, which, um, but that's just the nature of it, I guess, of that work. But, um, Um, yeah, I, I'll look at that <laughs> picture. God, these are really good. Yeah, these are all from Mr. Honda's estate. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Nice. Interesting. Well, what, what are, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Do you, are these in your book that uh, did you include? Yeah. A few yeah. of them are in the book, and the rest of them we have available for the uh, uh, Ishiro Honda website. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Some yeah. of them. Some of them are really intimate, and and I don't mean this one where this is obviously uh, a scene, <laughs> but I mean the 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 one uh, previous. I'll go back to it. This one here. Look at this. This is you and the director going over pages in the script. I mean, this is really uh, fascinating. A window into the process behind these films. And uh, I just uh, really enjoy seeing the, the close interaction between 
you and the director. It's it's really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll oh, go ahead. Ed. Yeah. Well, uh, what did uh, the film Latitude Zero do for your career? You think it uh, it helped your career? Oh yeah, for sure, because that kind of ushered in. Um, I, it had to be uh, that I did Room Two Twenty Two after Latitude Zero, mm -hmm. and um, because I had n nothing to show until I did that. It's surprising that I got hired though, uh, because I didn't. I really didn't have any experience um, with acting and. I modeled as a child and I, I, I didn't really like it, but I, um, I did whatever my mom wanted me to do. And, um, and I did a lot of modeling and, um, but I really am. She, she sent me to an acting school and I put the brakes on there. I wouldn't, I did not want to go back and I didn't go back. But um, it's funny, I keep on losing my train of thought because I'm thinking about things that flash through my mind. And, and I'll be thinking of one thing and then something else will occur to me. And it's like, oh, what was I? It's hard to get back to where I was, what I was talking about initially. Well, um, it, uh, you mentioned Room 222, which was one of my yeah. favorite. That was on in reruns for a long time. I just love that show. I still watch it occasionally. I have the the DVDs that came out some years ago. And there were so many actors that came up uh, through that show on, in little parts that some of whom became, you know, really big stars. And, um, and But you did a lot of TV, uh, as I recall, during that time period, or at least a considerable amount. So that must have been a, a good training ground because you have to prepare, I think, uh, you know, and work on a faster schedule. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, um, again, I, w I was super uncomfortable while I was acting. I didn't, um, I didn't get comfortable acting until after I had gone to Eric Morris's uh, workshop and uh, and I also became a member of the actor's studio. Mm -hmm. I've got um, tools to so that I wouldn't be as self-conscious as as I was um, because you can't be nervous if you're or you, um, if you're thinking about other things if you're not self-conscious um but anyway i <clears throat> things got easier for me um after i um after i learned a way to bring out whatever it was that needed to you know whatever it was that um needed to be done or mm -hmm. portrayed and um before that, I um, when I did Room 222 and Latitude Zero, I didn't have any of that. I just kind of winged it mm, okay. and um, was really uncomfortable. Hmm. But they, I think that they turned out pretty good considering how I felt, um, which is, is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. Maybe now I'm just not as critical. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> uh, one of your best known roles is as a sex worker in Coffee, in which your character has a, a big nasty fight with Pam Greer. Can you tell us a little bit about that film? Yeah, it was fun with... Um, um, with Pam and um, uh, the guacamole and all that. <laughs> um, yeah. You get a salad, a whole bowl of salad dumped on your head. It's uh, right, right. That's, a, that's brave acting. And also, it's the, I don't know if you remember the scene where she puts, I think, uh, razor blades in her wig or her hair yeah. as you're, you're trying to grab her 
her hair to pull it, it your hands get all bloody it's a yeah good, yeah it's a, a really uh fun movie from that time period uh, yeah jack hill do you remember working with jack hill i do yeah 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 I he was you know it, it was really um easy to work with i was really lucky because i worked with really good directors um 99 of the time um and the and the the one that it was probably the one that i wasn't so thrilled with he was probably good but i just um i don't know who what he did or anything but anyway um um yeah jack hill was um was great to work with and um the the movie you know that all of them were um easy to work with and um it was fun because of the action are you of often it. you kind of played uh if and correct me if i'm wrong but you often played women who were victims in one way or another and um and yet this was a kind of a time of women's empowerment Right. So I wondered how you felt about that. We're throwing up a, a scene from, uh, which is kind of a uh, an exception, uh, Rolling Thunder, which is a, a really great movie from that time period. And it's really, I think, one of your best parts. But um, how did you feel about the roles that you were cast in a lot of the time? Um, I felt... At one point, I didn't like it. I think when I left Hollywood, I was aware of the kind of roles that I had done. And I didn't have anyone that said, oh, you did a really good job. So when I left, <clears throat> when I left Hollywood, although, well, that was one reason, too, mm -hmm. um, that I, I was not... Um, I didn't really like the roles. I mean, they were, I did, but I wanted other roles as well. Um, and uh, um, I, <laughs> it's hard to go back that far. Um, yeah, I did. You know, it was it was that way, but. Uh, Essentially, I left, you know, for for other reasons, but I I didn't really have any way to know if I was doing a good job or not. And then, people, once we got the internet, things oh. changed, and now I still get fan mail, which is like unbelievable because um, I'm surprised anybody remembers me. I think um, didn't somebody even write a, a book about you at one point? Yes, it, it's kind of a short. Um, uh, yeah, Tom Graves wrote. Um, it's like I guess a mini book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's kind of um, doesn't go into any details or. The things that he doesn't talk about the things that I think are interesting. Okay. But, um, but nevertheless, it's interesting that someone felt, uh, yeah. you know, you, you have such a fan base that you, uh, you know, somebody felt compelled to write about you. In that oh, way. I know. That's, yeah. you know, I'm, um, I'm very grateful that mm -hmm. people appreciate, you know, what I did. And had I known that that was going to happen, I there's a good chance I wouldn't have left. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I didn't know then. I I just figured like mm, I'm not going to keep on doing this because I really didn't think that the roles that I got were that great. Mm -hmm. So okay. Well, uh, on the screen now is a, a photo of you working together with Paul Newman in Rolling Pool. Yeah. Was, yeah, really good and underrated detective film. Uh, what was it like to work with uh, Mr. Newman? 
Oh, it was super. Very good. Um, yeah, he, he was very easy to work with. And um, he, I rode with him from Lake Charles back to Lafayette. And he had his own car. And um, he had Mario Andretti's uh, driver was the person he, um, driving him in that car. So <clears throat> um, we drove back from uh, Lake Charles, filming in Lake Charles, back to Lafayette. And we sat in, Paul Newman and I sat in the back seat drinking wine all the way back. And... Um, which was really fun. And then when I looked out the window, um, I, I looked like the cars were stopped on the freeway. But what they were is they were going, I guess it was 55, the speed limit. And we were, God knows how fast we were going. <clears throat> but I thought um, that was fun. And um Anyway, yeah, it was fun. Anybody, who, if are there any fans out there of yours watching now who haven't seen you in some of these films we're talking about, I especially uh, encourage them to seek out The Drowning Pool, which is just a, a really good movie uh, overall. I, there were a number of, after Chinatown, I believe, there were a number of like detective movies in the 70s that that genre kind of came up again for a while the drowning pool is one of the the best ones i love paul newman anyway but and you have real two at least two really good scenes with him your your character lives in a trailer or a trailer park right. and he, he comes to you for help and um you have one of the the, the great scenes in the movie at the end where you kind of like you know say goodbye to him which is just wonderful so uh, you definitely have a rich, you know, history uh, and legacy, and it's not surprising that people are rediscovering you. I think uh, you did some really good work, and uh, even though you decided to leave, I, I mean, I think maybe that was the right time um, because films changed after that, and um, uh, so it's wonderful to to talk to you about all these experiences. Do you want to? Kind of in closing, a talk. Any uh, tell us what you're doing now, or or what you've been doing, and uh, if anybody you know is a fan, if they wanted to reach out to you, is there a way for them to do that? Um, I um, live in Somerville, and um, my address is I, I think it's in the internet because uh, that this is the first time I've gotten fan mail. I think nobody knew where I was when I lived in um, Benita Springs because I once in a while something would come. But um, we get three or four a week. Yeah, a lot. I know that's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> but um, um. Um, oh, um, what, what, what we were talking about? Oh, just asking. Man, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what, what, what uh, you're doing now. So, oh, you... I've, I've retired. I'm retired. I worked in a uh, law office for years mm -hmm. and, um, and that paid the bills. Um, so, and I also, I, I lived in uh, the Bahamas for a while, which was really nice. Um, um, now I've retired and um, I live in Summer, Somerville, South Carolina. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Linda, for this time. And thank you to your son. I, I don't remember your son's name. I'm sorry. But I know he's been kind of running uh, tech off camera for us. And I appreciate yeah. that very much. Um, we, uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with, uh, with us and with our audience. And, um, 
I want to remind everyone out there, thank everybody for watching, but also remind you that uh, our full programming, full programming schedule <laughs> is available at kaijumasterclass.com. Our interview with Norman Anglin, the author, uh, is uh, just about starting right now uh, elsewhere on our YouTube channel. You can find it from uh, kaijumasterclass.com, from the watch uh, link on the homepage or from the schedule page. Thanks, Linda. It's great talking. Thank okay, you, thank Linda. you. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. All right, All right take care now. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.